Okay, here's where we were last time. So we were uh, talking about the second derivative test. Um, I reminded you of the second derivative test in single variable. Um, motivated it from the second order Taylor polynomial, which is here. I hope that you guys all recognize this. And the point is, if you're at a critical point, f prime is zero, that makes this term disappear, thus leaving you only with this, um, which is in the shape of a parabola pointing either up or down depending on the sign of the second derivative. So that's kind of motivates, I mean, this is just a, a point of view on why the sign of the second derivative being positive or negative uh, determines whether or not you have a, uh, a critical point that is a local max or a local min. So it's a, I think it's a nice point of view. And it generalizes pretty nicely in the multivariable case. So here is what the multivariable second order Taylor polynomial looks like. It's a little weirder admittedly. Um, you've got the constant zeroth order term. You've got your first order term determined by the gradient and your second order term. So if you're at a critical point, the gradient vector is zero, which means that this term disappears just like in the single variable case. And again, what you're left with, well now, okay, this is a little different. You're left with, uh, did I write this down? Yeah, here you are. You're left with this. And what in the world is that? Well, uh, we need to know what that looks like. And that's complicated, is the, the bad news. It's not as simple as, um, uh, oh, let's see, you know, either a paraboloid up or a paraboloid down. It, there's the fact that there's a dot product in here, the fact that there's a matrix being multiplied by x minus a on one side of the dot product, it's just a little different. So. Um, I'm actually not going to be able to show you a full analysis of how to understand that term. It's something called a quadratic form. It's something that you would study if you were to take a course in linear algebra. Um, Math 216 actually doesn't talk about quadratic forms, but Math 221 does. Um, so I'm just going to show you the punchline. And what we're interested in is whether or not, you know, are there situations, is there some circumstance that I can detect that will allow me to determine when this term is either always positive, in which case we have a local minimum, or always negative, in which case we're going to have a local maximum. And there are some conditions where you can draw that conclusion. And uh, here they are. So this uh, I'm just going to state this as a theorem. Again, we're not going to prove this results beyond what we can really do in this course. It breaks down into cases. It's kind of smacks of the second derivative test that y'all saw um, in single variable, but it is importantly different. So there's a preliminary thing you have to look at. You have to look at the determinant of the Hessian matrix and decide if it's positive or negative. And it's really only if the determinant is positive that you get something that looks like the second derivative test. And so here's uh, you know, the, um, what happens in that case. If the determinant is positive, then you look at the x second partial. If it's negative, you have a local maximum. And if it's positive, then you have a local minimum. And again, that you know, really does feel like the, the, the single variable second derivative test. That's only the rule if that determinant is positive. Um, the, the other case that you have to consider is if the determinant is negative, which of course it very well might be. It's a determinant. It could be either sign. If the determinant's negative, you have a saddle point. And it doesn't really matter what the, uh, what the individual second partials are. Uh, negative determinant means saddle point. Okay. So um, now again, why this is true uh, is just, uh, more than we can talk about in this course. So I'm just going to show you some examples of this, and uh, then we'll uh, move along. So here we go. Uh, let's uh, look at this function. Uh, we've looked at this function before. We found two critical points. Now, when we saw these critical points last time, uh, we had to kind of throw up our hands and say, I don't know what these are. These are, these are points that represent our failure to understand what's happening with this function. 
The whole point of these points is that we don't understand them. Right? So now we have a foot in the door on that. Um, <coughs> so looking at this uh, function here, I can compute its various partials, first order partials, second order partials, etc. And here's the Hessian matrix. Now this is just a matter of computing second derivatives, second partials. Right? That's exactly what this Hessian matrix is. The Hessian matrix is the matrix of second partials. Um, so you compute it. There it is. Here's a formula for the determinant. And that then is what we're going to plug in here, decide if it's positive or negative, and then consider further conditions uh, to see what happens. So uh, let's look at these two points. Uh, this first point, well, let's do the second point first. Uh, that point, uh, whoops, that point, if you plug it in there, you get a negative number. So for that critical point, the Hessian determinant is negative, and that means saddle point. Everybody good? That's just plugging straight into the theorem. All right, now about the other point, you know, what can we conclude about that? Well, you plug that point into this formula here for the Hessian determinant. We'll see x is 1, so uh, the determinant's positive. Okay. And what can we conclude from that? Well, that says we need to look more closely. Uh, we need to look now at, oops, we need to look at the... Um, Second partial with respect to x. There's the second partial with respect to x. It's 6x. And let's see, x is 1 at the point that we're looking at. And that's positive. And that means we have a local minimum. Plugging straight into the pan. Okay. Now, uh, I do want to notice that there are some gaps in this theorem. Can't be helped. Um, the reality is, is that the Hessian matrix, the, the first and second partials, are simply not enough information to always resolve for you. You know, what, how do you classify a given critical point? Not that new, really. I and mean, we saw back in single variable calculus that the second derivative is zero, then you know nothing. Right? The test fails. You have to look for other methods. So that happens here. Uh, look at this. Look at the cases uh, on the determinant of the Hessian matrix. Uh, if it's positive, okay, then there's one thing. If it's negative, that's another thing. But what if it's zero? No comment. Right? So if, it, if your Hessian determinant is zero, the test fails, and that test will not allow you to draw any conclusions at all. Okay. Likewise, even if the Hessian is positive, What if that second derivative is zero? No comment from the theorem. So the test fails if that happens. Uh, at which point, again, you know, the, the, you get to draw no conclusions. Here's an example where that happens. Uh, there's a uh, innocent seeming little function. Take the gradient, set it equal to zero. Uh, you get a critical point at the origin. I'll let you guys fill in the details on your own time. Not hard to fill in. Uh, here's the Hessian matrix, and at the origin, the Hessian matrix is has a determinant which is zero. Second derivative test fails, and so we are left wondering what's going on with this function. Okay, now when the second derivative test fails, that doesn't mean that it is simply unknown to humanity what kind of a critical point this is. It just means that the test has failed. You can employ other methods, and I want to show you for this particular function, uh, what else might we do to classify that critical point. And here's a picture of a critical, no, bad choice of words, an important level set for this function. So uh, our domain is R2, right? And let's plug in, where is f equal to zero? Where is this function here? Zero. 
Well, if y is 0, the function is 0. Or if y is equal to x squared, the function is equal to 0. So the, that critical point, excuse me, that uh, level set looks like that. That's where the function is equal to 0. And you can plug in a couple of points and observe that the function is positive in these two regions and the function is negative in these two regions. So now going back and keeping in mind, I want to understand what I can conclude about that point at the origin. Well, at this point, the value of the function is 0. And the function is clearly bigger in these sort of top and bottom regions. So there's no way that's a maximum. It can't be a maximum. The function's bigger nearby. However near you want it to be, in anywhere in this top region, anywhere in this bottom region, the function is positive and therefore bigger than zero. So definitely not a maximum. But then look at these side regions. The function's negative over here. So there's no way that could be a minimum either. Zero is not the minimum if it's negative nearby. So it's neither a maximum nor a minimum. And that means that this is a saddle point. You can even kind of visualize kind of with the shape of the saddle. It sort of it curves, you know, up. And the function's positive down here, so it's sort of curving up in the back, and it's curving up. There's sort of a little mountainside sort of in front of you, and then the, the dips, sort of the leg holes, go into these negative regions on the side. So it's kind of a warped saddle. Okay, so it's not the second derivative test, but allows us to draw a conclusion. Now, I want to show you uh, one last thing about this function. It's an interesting function, uh, and that is I want to show you an argument, a very tempting argument, that is false. Very tempting, but wrong. And that is... In this example, um, let's look at it along all of the lines going through the origin. Plug in y equals mx, right? That's a line going through the origin. And let's see what does the function look like um, on each of those lines, one at a time. Well, you plug y equals mx into the function, and this is what you get. No big deal. And you can take the second derivative. Plug in x equals 0, and it's never negative. In fact, it's usually positive, but it's never negative. So now it's tempting to look at this little bit of algebra and conclude, oh, OK, well, that means the function is, I mean, since we're looking at its second derivative in these various different directions, it's tempting to say that, well, it's, it's concave up in practically every direction. OK, now it's kind of level in that. Wonder when m is equal to zero is the one instance where it's sort of you know flat there. But if it's concave up in every other direction, doesn't that mean that this function is in fact concave up? Wouldn't that make this a minimum? It's a very tempting uh, thought, and it's false. We already know it's false because we've already eliminated the possibility that it's a minimum. The function's <laughs> negative over here. Can't be that this is a minimum functions smaller nearby. So it's tempting to draw the conclusion by this argument, but it's false. Um, but now you can uh, take uh, this kind of a point of view and see why it's false by instead of plugging in a line, uh, plug in that quadratic. You plug that into the function, and you see that the function looks like that. And now it, you can see very clearly, this is clearly sort of concave down. And so we no longer have, uh, it's clear now that this function is clearly not a, um, uh, this critical point is not a uh, minimum. Um, but you can't tell with the straight lines. So now you might recall when we were talking about uh, derivatives, directional derivatives, Back in chapter four, uh, well, earlier in chapter four, um, remember we were talking about limits, directional derivatives, and we came to this sad realization that you can't really understand limits of multivariable functions very well by looking along straight lines. Multivariable limits are weirder than that. What if you approach along a spiral or a 
cubic polynomial, all sorts of different curved ways that you can approach a point, and the function looks different in ways that straight lines can't predict. Likewise with directional derivatives. Directional derivatives are not always, even if they exist and are perfectly fine and simple along every straight line, it's, the function still might not be differentiable. Weird things can happen. And this is just another example, uh, arguably kind of a second derivative sort of example uh, of an old fact, an old idea, which is that multivariable functions are simply not well understood by looking along straight lines. So I think that's um, it's a nice little warning of what not to do. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move on now. That was um, unconstrained optimization. I want to move on now to constrained optimization. <coughs> Excuse me. The big theorem that we're going to talk about eventually uh, is called the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Well, there's a couple of them. I'm going to show you. <coughs> a lot of people mispronounce this as Lagrange. Um, French mathematician Lagrange. Okay. Even if you're from Texas or a ZZ Top fan, where it's pronounced Lagrange, right? That's the, the mathematician's Lagrange. Um, so, quick definition: we talk about a constrained local maximum. We talked last time in the, in the previous section. We talked about unconstrained local maxima. A constrained local maximum is just a local maximum at a constrained point. So in other words, it's a local maximum, for example, on the boundary of your shape, whatever that might be, as opposed to being in the interior. All right, so um, we had in the last section criteria for how we would find unconstrained local maxes, unconstrained critical points, and take the gradient, set it equal to zero, give some concern, consideration to whether the function might fail to be differentiable. That doesn't happen. But it's another condition. Uh, and that was it. These being constrained points, things change. The condition changes. You have to treat it differently. Um, and uh, But there is something in common, and that is that what we're going to be doing is still a process of elimination. In fact, we're going to still use the same, fundamentally, the same simple-minded uh, idea of how we might eliminate a point as a possible maximum. That is, we're going to try to find some way that we can just kind of move nearby where the function's bigger. Very simple-minded. Adapted appropriately, of course, to our new circumstance. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we are going to consider uh, a case. Uh, we're going to look at the case where the domain in question is defined by an equation. Now let me show you what that would look like. So uh, we've considered in the past, um, you know, what if your domain is this solid here? Well, if you're at such a, if you're on such a solid, then a point inside of that solid, well, you can move in any direction you need. That's an unconstrained point on that domain. We're now going to consider not that. We're going to consider on the surface. So this is, a, in this case, a boundary of a solid region. So suppose that that is our domain. The function's only defined. We're only allowed to consider the function on that surface, defined by an equation. So it's a level set of a certain function. And on that constraint set, where is a certain function maximized, minimized? How do I find critical points? So it's a very different question. Um, importantly, again, I got to stay on the set. So if I'm at a particular point, uh, I can move, you know, that way. I can move this way. I can move that way or this way. Or I can't move that way. So um, this is uh, called the uh, constraint function. Uh, whoops. So that's the constraint equation, and the function itself 
is the constraint function. Now, don't confuse that function with the function that we're actually trying to optimize, the function whose maximum we're trying to find. Um, uh, that is called the objective function. So it's, it's easy to kind of blur these two functions. They're both functions that have something to do with our question, but they play very different roles. Um, looking at this picture again, there's a function that defines the point that I'm allowed points that I'm allowed to look at, but maybe I want to optimize. Uh, let's say maybe I want to find the maximum value of height, so z, right? Well, z is a totally different function from whatever function it is whose level set defines this surface. They're totally different functions. So make sure to keep them straight in your mind. Uh, in the development that I'm doing here, the function that we're, um, uh, our constraint function, uh, I'm going to call g. And the objective function, I'm going to call f. So we're going to try to maximize f with the understanding that we're constrained by the fact that g has to equal to zero or some constant. Okay. Okay. So, uh, by the way, this is what our picture, you know, you set g equal to zero, you're looking at some level set, you're looking at a surface then in R3. Uh, there is another case that you could consider as well, um, which is what if you have two variables well, then a level set is a curve in R2. Set. Um, they're kind of different pictures. They're, you know, there's different examples of the same basic idea, though, of a um, uh, constraint function. Okay. So I'm going to do the development in the three-dimensional case because the pictures are a little bit harder to draw and uh, I want to show you sort of the more general case. But I think it would be constructive for you guys to also think about what would the analogous pictures be in the two-dimensional case. They're going to be totally analogous. In fact, a little easier because they're easier. They're two-dimensional pictures, but um, worth thinking through. Okay. All right. So let's, um, let's actually do this now. A uh, quick observation to make about the constraint set. Let's look at this picture. Um, again, here's our set. The first observation I want to make is at a point on the constraint set, the gradient of the constraint function has to be perpendicular to that constraint set. And this is an old fact. Because we already know from long ago that gradients are always perpendicular to their level sets of that function. So that's an old, old fact from a while. Okay, does everybody remember that fact? Okay. All right. Now let me move down here to this picture. Um, what does the objective function have to do with this? The function that we're trying to maximize. Now let me redraw. There's our constraint set, so we're confined to this surface. Not allowed to leave that surface. Uh, I want to consider uh, at a point here, and try to find the maximum value of this function f. I'm entertaining the possibility that maybe, possibly, could that point be a maximizer for this objective function f. Well, let's consider what the gradient of f might look like. Uh, I'm going to suppose that that is the gradient vector for our objective function. And let's try to eliminate this point as a possible maximum. Now, what we did in the previous section was to say, well, uh, wherever you are, just why don't you just go in the direction of the gradient vector. As you move in the direction of the gradient vector, the function is clearly increasing unless the gradient is zero, but uh, if, the if the gradient's non-zero, as you move in the direction of the gradient vector, function's increasing. That can't be a maximum. We throw it away and never look back. The problem is we can't do that here. Right? The problem is we remain confined to this surface. 
I can't move in the direction of the gradient vector of f. The gradient vector of f might be pointing off of the surface. It might not be a tangent vector. Because that's a constrained point, right? Not every vector is a tangent vector. Gradient of f probably isn't. So our old criterion eh, doesn't really, our old elimination strategy kind of crashes and burns. Okay. So the easy fix is to say, well, look, I, sure, I mean, I, hmm, I, I see that I can't move exactly in the direction of the gradient vector, but let's just look at the gradient of f, look at its shadow down here in this tangent plane to the surface. It's going to have some sort of a shadow there, right? Let's move in that, that direction. And that's perfectly fine. Right? Take that gradient, but there's some exceptions we'll talk about. But they take this gradient vector as drawn, just project it down into the tangent plane. That's a tangent vector. I'm perfectly able to move through my constraint set surface with that being my velocity vector at that point. And what happens, well, what happens is um, my directional derivative, as I move in that v direction, it's this dot product, which is computed by that formula. And the length of v, I can determine from the trigonometry of that little triangle. And the punchline is, there is the directional derivative. And it looks positive. Which suggests that the as I move in that direction, the function's increasing, which means that couldn't possibly be a maximum, and I throw it away. Eliminate it as a possible maximum. Does everybody see how the argument works? Now again, we just have to consider where might this argument fail. Um, there are some assumptions that go into the argument that I just gave you. Uh, for one thing, we assume that the function's differentiable. You had to assume differentiability to write down that formula. Um, I am assuming that the gradient vector is, isn't zero. I mean, if the gradient vector is zero, then there's no projection. The projection is zero. That doesn't give me a direction to move. And I, again, have no argument. Uh, lastly, I assume that the gradient of f isn't perpendicular to the surface. If the gradient here were perpendicular to the surface, then its projection would, again, be the zero vector, meaning that I don't have a direction to move. And again, the argument uh, would fail. So I assume that the gradient is not perpendicular to the surface. All right, so as long as these conditions hold, I can eliminate that point as a possible maximum. So this is the sort of adapted, you know, adapted to our constraint circumstance um, process of elimination. All right, now with as with all of the optimization stuff we've done before, uh, what we actually do in trying to find maxima is, in fact, ignore these points. That's the punchline. Is I have concluded that this is what I'm not looking for. Right? So what we want to know is where does this argument fail? Where are there points that I can't eliminate as a possible maximum? Well, this argument fails <coughs> if either of these three conditions fails. If either of those three conditions fails, I can't eliminate it as a possible maximum. And I have to uh, admit failure give it a name, call it a critical point, and try to figure something out by hook or by crook later. So that's how we define critical points. Critical points are points where one of these conditions, one or more of these conditions fail. So here we go. Point is a critical point, a constrained critical point. We're looking at a constraint set. If the functions are not differentiable, if the gradient is the zero vector, or if the gradient is perpendicular to my surface. So this is how we find critical points in the uh, multivariable, constrained multivariable case. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Is everybody on board?
Um, this bad news in this process, this isn't how we, you know, day in and day out, this is not how we actually turn the crank um, because of this third condition. Um, we don't have a convenient formula for how to detect if a vector is perpendicular to a surface. We just we don't have that tool algebraically in our in our toolbox. Um, so what I'm going to do is draw what this looks like when the gradient of f is perpendicular to the surface and make an observation. So here's our constraint set. There's a gradient of f being perpendicular to the surface. But remember, we already argued long ago, back here, way back up here, that the constraint gradient is always perpendicular to the surface. Everywhere, no exceptions. Um, unless, unless it doesn't have a derivative. It's a zero vector, that's weird. But, um, So the constraint gradient looks like that. So if I want to know when the gradient of f is perpendicular to the surface, I can do that simply by detecting when it is parallel to the gradient of g. Lucky break, right? Being perpendicular to this surface is the same as being parallel to that normal path. So we have that condition. This sort of replaces that condition. Everybody good? Now, uh, oh, by the way, good news, it also replaces this condition where the gradient of f might equal to 0. I don't have to worry about that anymore because lambda equals 0. That scalar lambda indicating this being a multiple of that. If that's zero, that encapsulates the gradient of f being zero also. So, uh, so that this one condition number three here accounts for two of our conditions up above. Now, there is a, an awkwardness. I, I do have to confess, um, I, I told you a little bit of a fib on purpose, trying to focus the attention on the big point here, which is that this is parallel to that. Well, and I kind of hinted at this, but what if the gradient of g is the zero vector. Well, the gradient of f might still be perpendicular to the surface as required. We could have a critical point. This is definitely a point that I can't eliminate with my argument, and yet, perpendicular though it is to the surface, it's not a multiple of the gradient of g because the gradient of g is the zero vector, and there is no multiple of the zero vector that gives you a non-zero vector. So, uh, so things, if the gradient of g is the zero vector, our uh, equivalence argument kind of fails. And so I have to throw that in as a condition as well. That's sort of our, mm, that's a compensation uh, for the, the, you know, translating as we have here. So. Again, I have three conditions. Uh, here's our uh, resulting theorem uh, that finds constrained critical points for us. All three of these things are algebraically tractable. Uh, the conditions are I'm looking for points where f is not differentiable, or I'm looking for points where the constraint gradient is zero, not the objective, not f, not the function we're trying to optimize. Forget that, that we're not doing that anymore. It's where the constraint gradient is equal to zero. Um, or where the objective gradient is a scalar multiple of the objective gradient. So again, these are all perfectly algebraically tractable. I'll show you some examples in a uh, couple of minutes. Um, so again, this is called the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Uh, the lambda is the Lagrange multiplier, which is why we use lambda. I've always assumed. Um, a little bit of terminology. Um, this condition is called uh, the degeneracy condition. Um, 
I don't want to go into why we call it that. Um, there are better reasons that I can explain in this course. Uh, but uh, roughly, uh, you can take it to mean that when the gradient, when the constraint gradient is equal to zero, it means something weird is happening, something uh, bad. So it, it's a reasonable name. There are other reasons better than this that we call it the degeneracy condition. Um, and then the multiplier condition, what we call the Lagrange condition. So I'm going to be using these names to point out that you know, we're going to be, as we go through and do optimization problems, we're going to be checking these various different conditions. The differentiability condition is pretty clear. Then the degeneracy condition. Then the Lagrange condition. All right. So here's an example. Um, I want to find uh, critical points of that function. Now it's tempting to say, well, hey, uh, that function gets as big as you want it to be and it gets as small as zero. Look at it, right? It can be as small as zero, clearly. Uh, it can certainly be as big as you want it to be. But if I say, listen, no, you're, now you're confined to this plane. I don't care about how big or small this function might get arbitrarily. I want to know how big, how small, might this function get with this constraint? So the origin is no longer allowed. Right. So this function can't be as small as zero. But how small can it get? Everybody see the, the question here? I mean, again, this is, this is a question. You can't uh, just look at the function by itself here. There's not enough information in this function. The, the formula for the function doesn't encapsulate the fact that I have constraints. Um, this kind of thing, again, very, very routine. Um, if you're um, mm, you know, um, a business person of some sort, it very reasonably might be that, look, you've got a certain amount of labor, a certain amount of capital. Uh, the more labor you use, the less capital you have at your disposal. And so there's this, there might be some sort of a trade-off, a grand total you know, capital plus labor plus, I don't know, some other businessy concept. Uh, you've got a constraint that that has to be a certain way. Maybe you want to maximize profit, but not just in general. You want to maximize profit subject to the constraints that you are imposed on. Okay. So it's a constrained optimization problem. Um, where does that function fail to be differentiable? It doesn't. Right? It's polynomial. It's differentiable everywhere. No problem. Uh, here's our constraint gradient. Uh, well, there's the constraint function. Uh, here's the constraint gradient. Where does that constraint gradient equal to zero? This is we're considering our degeneracy condition. Is there any value of x, y, and z that can make this vector equal to zero? Well, of course not. Look at it. It's constant. 632 is never 000. zero, zero. So, so there's no critical points from the degeneracy condition either. Now, finally, the Lagrange condition. Uh, our objective gradient is that. Our constraint gradient, again, we've already written that down. Our constraint gradient, it whoops, no. Our constraint gradient is that. And I want to know where is this objective gradient? A multiple, a scalar multiple of the objective, uh, of, I think I said that backwards. Where is our objective gradient? A scalar multiple of our constraint gradient. And notice what I have then is a little system of equations. I've got three equations there. And I just want to know what are the x, y, and z that make this happen. Okay. Is everybody on board? All right. Now, I've deliberately left something off here, uh, off the screen, anyway. Um, that's not really the whole truth. I'm not just looking for any old point that satisfies these equations. Because don't forget, very critically, and again, there's the bad pun. Very importantly, I'm looking for points that satisfy these requirements, which are on our constraint set. Anything that's off this constraint set, we could not care less about. 
that constraint set is imposed upon us. Right? So um, there's a fourth equation that I have to include here, which is the constraint itself. So when you're when you're trying to find points that satisfy the Lagrange condition, you've got to write down the Lagrange condition and your constraint equation. And that gives you uh, for functions of three variables like we're looking at here, uh, it gives you four equations. And by the way, it's kind of good news because if you look at the original thing here, there's not really enough information to answer this question. We've got four variables but only three equations. You wouldn't typically expect that to give you a s small number of solutions. So with the constraint equation thrown in there, as we must, the good news is we have four equations, four unknowns, and foot in the door. Okay. Now, <laughs> bad news, uh, you've got four equations and four unknowns, and uh, so algebraically, right, it's uh, uh, potentially bad news. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how you solve these. Uh, it, in general, broadly speaking, it's very hard, right, but there are certain methods that mm, surprisingly often end up working. Um, so uh, again, it's one of these deals where I can't give you a here's how you do it, but I can show you uh, enough examples that you'll uh, be able to sort of you know make sense of it. The, the questions that I'm going to give you all on exams have to be reasonable, uh, and so uh, these are the kinds of methods that are going to be useful. Okay. All right. So in this case, notice how lambda shows up in those three equations, as it must. That's how lambda shows up in the uh, Lagrange condition. Pretty good method that works in this case is eliminate lambda. In other words, solve for lambda in all three of these equations and set those all equal to each other because, of course, they are all equal to the same thing. They're all equal to lambda. So I'm going to solve for lambda in all three of those equations. Um, Lambda in the first equation is x over 3, in the second equation it's 2y over 3, in the third equation it's z, and so therefore these three things have to equal to each other. And note that in these two equations that I have boxed, there's no lambdas in there anymore, so we've eliminated lambda. Um, now, in, now what do you do with that? Well, you can solve for one of these ver uh, for two of these variables in terms of the other one. In this case, I can turn that into the observation that y is equal to x over two and z is equal to x over three. Now, what do you do with that? Mm. Well, I can't get this onto the page at the same time here. But if y is equal to x over two, you can plug that into your constraint equation. Z is equal to x over three. Plug that into your constraint equation. Note that your constraint equation that had involved x, y, and z now only involves x, and you can then solve for x. Everybody good? Uh, once you solve for x, that lets you solve for y, and that lets you solve for z. See how that played out? It was a pretty useful move. Uh, I don't want to say, well, anyway, it's, it's a very commonly best move um, for uh, how to solve the Lagrange condition. All right. Um, I want to show you all where a particular landmine lies. Um, here's another example. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, there's our objective function, same objective function. Here's our constraint equation. This is now an ellipsoid. So I want to maximize or minimize, you know, find the candidate maxes and mins of uh, this same function, but now I'm constrained to a different shape. Right, okay, well, so uh, this function's differentiable. Great. Um, the constraint gradient. Looks like that. Is that ever equal to zero? Well, kinda. I mean, it, I mean, if you, if I set this equal to zero and solve, then yeah, x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero. There is a point where that constraint gradient is equal to zero. It's just that that point isn't 
on my constraint set. So it doesn't matter. So again, be very wary of this situation. Lots of students will report in this example 000 as being uh, a, a degenerate critical point. But it's not. It's a point that has n not even anywhere near close to our constraint set. This has got nothing to do with the problem. Does everybody see that? Always plug back in and make sure that that works. Okay. okay, so we have no differentiability problems and we have no constraint gradient problems. So here's finally what our Lagrange condition turns into. There's Lagrange condition, gradient of f, multiple gradient g. These are the equations that it turns into. And now here's the landmine. Here's the dangerous spot in this example. It's tempting to look at that and say, well, there's lambda. I'm going to solve for lambda in these three equations. You look at the first equation, and it's, gosh, pretty tempting to say, well, doesn't lambda have to equal to 1? But doesn't lambda also have to equal to 1 fourth? Doesn't it also have to equal to 1 ninth? How could one number equal to three different values? Uh, therefore, no solutions. Very tempting argument. Everybody see the temptation? This is um, not correct. This is uh, sloppy algebra. This is sadly uh, a kind of sloppy algebra that is uh, all too commonly sort of condoned in high school um, uh, math classes. It's the over, over permitting of cancellation. You can't cancel things that might be zero. So in particular, uh, let me look at this equation. All right, and let's consider the possibility that x might be zero. If x is zero, then lambda could be 47. And that would perfectly fine satisfy that equation. So we don't have contradictions here. Everybody see the point there? Lambda could be anything if x is equal to 0. OK. So what we have to do is break it down into cases. Uh, one at a time, I have to consider what assumptions do I need to write down for example, in order to be able to do something with that equation, well, if I want to solve for lambda in that equation, I've got to assume that x is non-zero. That's an assumption. So if, you know, given that I make an assumption that x is non-zero, then yes, I can use this equation. I can conclude that lambda is equal to 1. And plugging in lambda equals 1 into these two equations, um, I can then solve for y and z. Well, if lambda is equal to 1, uh, whoops, lambda is equal to 1, 2y equals 8y means y equals 0. And likewise, 2z equals 18z means z is equal to 0. So when x is non zero, y and z are 0. And if y and z are 0, uh, whoops, y and z and zero are 0, you can look back into the constraint equation and see that x has to be plus or minus 6. So you actually get two critical points if, you know, in the case where x is not a 0. Now, that's not exhaustive. I mean, x doesn't actually have to be equal to 0. So you can make a similar argument here for what if y is non-zero, what if z is non-zero, and you get uh, more critical points. When you assume y is non-zero, you get these two critical points. And when you assume z is non-zero, you get those critical points. So the sloppy, um, oh, it's OK, it's only high school argument of just cancel everything that looks like it'd be nice to cancel gives you no critical points at which which means you missed six critical points. It's catastrophic. All right, so be very, very on the lookout for this kind of thing. This kind of thing is unavoidably important when you're doing optimization problems. This algebra concern. So don't cancel things that might be zero. Or if you do want to cancel them, as we did, you have to confess, consider that as a case uh, of the thing you're canceling not being zero and then worry about the consequences later.
All right. Um, so I think that's an important example. Okay. Um, see how far we get in this. Um, I want to talk about the case of uh, what happens if you have two constraints. This is this is very different. Right? So let's look at this picture here. What if it's not enough simply to say that uh, I'm on you know some surface here defined by a constraint? What if there is a separate constraint uh, that this other function is also required? to be zero. So maybe, for example, maybe the g equals zero, maybe that's your sort of feasibility constraints. I've got this little small business, uh, labor, capital, etc. are all related by the reality that I only have so much uh, that I can do with my small company. Maybe this other constraint is some sort of a government restriction. You know, that uh, whatever combination of you know what your pay your your employees and uh, how pollution that you produce uh, some combination of those is required to be something right so in some sense you might call these the internal constraints and the external constraints of your company well that's a very plausible scenario you've got two separate constraints and the method that we've talked about doesn't address how to how to solve this uh, as is so in reality I'm actually confined not to either one of those surfaces. I'm confined to their intersection curve. Hmm. So how would I find critical points on that curve? Or said differently, how would I eliminate possible maxima on that curve and subsequently by process of elimination infer the critical points? So it's a very similar argument really. Get right down to it. Um, notice, uh, whoops, notice that our um, first constraint function has a constraint gradient that's always perpendicular to it. Our second constraint function has a constraint gradient that's always perpendicular to it. And that means that on the intersection curve, at a point, both of these constraint gradients are actually perpendicular to the curve. Okay. Now, uh, what about the uh, the objective function? Let's suppose that the uh, function that I'm trying to maximize uh, has a gradient that looks like there's my objective gradient. Uh, the argument that I'm going to make if I, in my process of trying to eliminate A as a possible maximum is I'm going to look at its projection and I'm going to argue very similarly that if I move in the direction of that projection vector V, well, the function's increasing as I move in that direction. That can't be a maximum. It's a very similar argument. It's just geometrically a little different because of the fact that it's a curve and I'm moving along instead of a surface. But I can still take my gradient and project it down to the tangent line for that curve. And again, this argument might fail. So when does this argument fail? Well, picture. this argument would fail if the gradient of F were in that plane perpendicular to the curve. Let's see, do I have a better picture of this? Yeah, here we go. Um, here's the plane perpendicular to that curve. And if my gradient of F is in that plane, then what happens when I project it? Well, that, look, it's perpendicular to the curve, and so when I project it down, I don't get a, I don't get a vector that represents a direction. I can go where the function's increasing. I get no direction. I get nothing. And so I have no argument in this case. When the constraint, again, very similar, very geometrically similar. It's when the, when the objective gradient is perpendicular to your constraint set, that your argument breaks down. What's um, different is how do I algebraically represent that 
being perpendicular to the curve. And it's not necessary. You can see right here from the picture, it doesn't have to be parallel to the gradient of H. It doesn't have to be parallel to the gradient of G. But it does need to be a linear combination of the two. All right, this yellow vector here would be well, some multiple of gradient of H plus some multiple of the gradient of G. And that's our new Lagrange condition. There's some details that I'm leaving out here. Um, but uh, of course, you have to worry about differentiability. There's various little degeneracy mm, annoyances that you have to worry about that, uh, that uh, admit when the, when the Lagrange condition fails. But this Lagrange condition simply says that the constraint gradient, excuse me, the objective gradient would have to be a linear combination of these two. Uh, I keep saying it backwards. The objective gradient would have to be a linear combination of these two constraint gradients. So just in terms of how the algebra looks on the page, note that was our Lagrange condition when we had one uh, constraint. Second constraint just means you get a second term. All right, and I'm going to not discuss the details of these uh, uh, degeneracy conditions, but it's in the book, and you can read through that. Um, I'm going to show you all an example of how you use this. Uh, suppose, again, here's a function that I want to optimize. Circle that. Function I want to optimize. And again, I'm not just allowed to plug in any x, y, and z that I want. I'm constrained by two constraints. Uh, I've got a stay on that cylinder, not allowed to leave the cylinder. Uh, and furthermore, I have to stay on that plane, I'm not allowed to leave the plane. So I have to stay on the intersection of these two uh, constraint surfaces. So, um, our uh, degeneracy, or our differentiability condition, no problem, that's clearly differentiable. Um, for degeneracy, I have to look at these two vectors and ask, where is either one of these zero? Uh, the gradient of H is never zero. That's obvious. It's, it's constant. Uh, the gradient of G might be zero. See, X and Y could be zero. That would make this vector zero. That would be a problem, except for the fact that if X and Y are both zero, um, if those are zero, you're not on the cylinder anymore. So again, not a problem. Right? That those points are not degeneracy critical points. And then lastly, you have to worry about where are where is either one of these a multiple of the other, and that never happens either, the key point being that one can never be a multiple of zero. All right. So where it gets fun is when you write down the Lagrange condition. Notice that your uh, objective gradient is a linear combination of your two constraint gradients. So that's just straight up writing down the Lagrange condition. Don't forget, I also have to write down my constraints. So grand total, awkwardly, we have five equations with five unknowns. And again, these can get really hairy and nasty in general. I'm a reasonable person that I am. I'm not going to give you any that are like algebraically intractable. Right? Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, there's certain tricks that are handy to know when you're trying to solve these. Um, I like to, on these, always kind of look for a foot in the door. Uh, when you write these as five separate equations, uh, one of these equations, you'll notice, is particularly nice. Look at that equation there. That equation, I can immediately conclude that mu is equal to 1. That's your little foot in the door. Uh, once you know mu is equal to 1, you can plug that in there and there. Looking at what remains here, you can eliminate lambda. Find a relationship between x and y. That relationship between x and y, you can plug into... Oh, whoops. You can, pl uh, you can plug into that equation, which then becomes that, and that allows you to solve for y. 
two possible values of y, that is. And once you know the possible values of y, uh, then uh, that allows you to solve for x, and then this allows you to solve for z. So you get two critical points. So again, you know, it's algebraically mm, delicate, right? Um, but uh, th these will work out uh, by some means kind of along these lines. All right, so that does it for this section. Um, okay, so I guess uh, we'll call it there. Um, the uh, the 4.13 is um, it's not that much in it. Um, uh, it's really just a kind of a combination of the ideas in 4.11 and 4.12. Uh, I am going to go ahead and record uh, separately a lecture on 4.13 just so I have a complete set uh, of, of, uh, for, this, for this book. Um, but I'm not going to hold you all responsible for 4.13. All right, see you guys later.